Welcome to the Culinary Treasure Podcast. I'm Stephen Shelman, your host. Today finds us in the magnificent state of Maine. I'm just so excited to be here. If you want to see all of the Culinary Treasure Network's Maine-centric content, be it culinary podcasts, craft beer podcasts, travel articles, food articles, uh, noteworthy wine journal articles, I invite you to go to adventuresonthemaincoast.com. But today I am at Hitchborn. Um, Chef Charlie uh, Zorich, did I get that right? You did. <laughs> well done. <laughs> I am so excited to be here. Actually, had dinner here last night. Uh, blew my socks off. Um, it was cold, so I had socks on. I don't know what would have happened <laughs> if I wasn't wearing socks. But the food was fantastic. Excited to tell your story. Uh, but before we do, I got to tell a little bit of a story. Um, so my friend, dear friend Michael uh, Susak. Um, who's a friend of yours. He is. He's a great uh, friend of mine. Yeah, I love Michael and Charlene. They're a chapter in my uh, first book, and I cheered them on when they had a food cart and cheered them on at their restaurant, Gigi's Cafe. For those uh, fans that live in Portland, Oregon, go have some real Liege-style waffles at Gigi's Cafe. They're pretty amazing. They are. Um, so I'm, I'm here for 10 days, and uh, a particular Friday night, uh, I don't have dinner booked, and I'm, there's a couple different restaurants near where I'm staying that see, look appealing, should I go or not? And they weren't speaking to me, and I listened to my heart, and I, I kind of more these days kind of woo-woo lean into the universe, opening things up. And I'm like, ah, something will open up for Friday night. And the next day, Michael messaged me on Facebook, hey, Stephen, I hear for the grapevine you're going to Maine. I got you all set up. You need to go to a friend of mine's place for dinner on Friday night. And I go, well... Well, Maine's a big state because uh, <laughs> I hadn't really put where I'm staying. I go, where? Right. Where's your friend at? And he goes, oh, he's in. He's near Rockland. And I go, I will be in Rockland on Friday. This is fantastic. Uh, so then he connected us. So thank you so much, Michael, for connecting us. And it was so awesome. You know, Mike Michael is a great chef in my world, and yeah. so great chefs know great chefs. So when he said that I needed to come here, I'm like, okay, we're going to have an incredible experience, which we did. Well, so I'm glad you guys came. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of fun. Thanks, Mike. <laughs> okay. Um, so where were you born? Uh, I was born in Astoria, Oregon. And uh, where'd you go to high school? I went to high school at Owaco High School in Owaco, Washington. Okay. There's a really good um, old fish trap uh, right near there. There uh, is. Chinook, right? Chinook. Yeah, you old fish trap uh, dive bar. Uh, yeah. Love me a good dive bar. So Astoria, Oregon, that's that's crazy. Uh, yeah. And then, what, what's the mascot at uh, Owaco High School? Uh, home of the Fisherman. <laughs> the Fisherman. <laughs> So tell me about where your uh, your cooking journey actually began. Not professional, but you know, as, as a young person. Uh, food was always central in my family. Uh, my great-grandmother was a caterer in Portland, Oregon. My grandmother uh, had a restaurant and a catering business in Astoria, Oregon. My father uh, went to culinary school uh, and had a restaurant when I was a, a kid over in Long Beach, Washington. And uh, my uh, so food has sort of always been part of my life and part of my story. Um, I grew up around people cooking all the time and uh, worked at a very early age for my for my grandmother when she needed extra hands in the kitchen when she was catering and uh, with all of my cousins and uh, my, my older cousins would work the floor, the younger cousins would be in the kitchen setting trays and uh, stuffing mushrooms. <laughs> so 14 year olds, you're stuffing mushrooms for catering events. Yep. And then uh, what's the cool place that you uh, you first started doing dishes at? Milton Lord? Oh, yeah. My first real job outside the family was a place called Milton York. Uh, it was a, a restaurant and candy company in Long Beach, Washington. I, I started out doing dishes there in the summertime and uh, at 14, I think for three eighty five an hour. And uh, uh, the restaurant would open at 5 a.m. and I would come in at 7 to tons of bus tubs of dishes and I would hustle and get them done. And uh, by the time I needed lunch... Uh, the cooks were ready to go out and have a smoke. And so uh, I, I would go on the line and cook myself a burger and fries. And when they figured out that I could cook, when they got busy or were shorthanded, they'd pull me up on the line and have me work with them. And so that's that's really back when I f was first working in like a commercial kitchen. <laughs> so you're washing dishes, you get hungry. Yeah. Uh, it's before the dinner rush. You say, hey, cook me something. They're like, cook it yourself. Yep. And so you did. And so I did. <laughs> <laughs> and that's kind of how it got started and I've I've always uh, yeah I've always been in kitchens in some capacity and then uh you you one of the one of your ways that you accessed your profession you went to culinary school yep I right after high school uh I moved up to Seattle for a short time and, and worked for a specialty foods company up there and then uh got my act together and then went to culinary school down in Portland Oregon at uh, what was Western Culinary and then eventually same great people opened OCI OCI that's so that's the way I like to take that trajectory yeah. <laughs> It's and, a good trajectory. <laughs> and I'm not, um, 
I, I can I can go either way as far as whether or not someone should or should not go to culinary school. Uh, to I, well, let me put it this way: I've had amazing food from people that have been to culinary school and people that have not. Absolutely. But if it was my own kids, I'd say just go to culinary school and learn that little bit extra. And you found it was helpful for your journey. Oh, I definitely think so. I mean, I I I, I definitely think so. It, it introduces you to a, a broad range of chefs as the instructors and ideas, and you can definitely learn it. You know, just you can definitely learn your chops coming up you know, working in kitchen after kitchen. But I think, you know, for a quick program, you know, one to two years, which Western was a year, it was uh, it was totally valuable for me. Good. And we're going to jump ahead uh, and come back in time. I don't know if you know Doctor Who and the TARDIS thing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, but you, you, before you got here to Maine, you worked at uh, Oregon and Washington, the Pacific Northwest, places like uh, Serafina, Sea Star. You had your own restaurant, um, Epicure, Epicure in Portland. Portland. Um, Until 2006. So a lot of amazing places you've worked at. Yeah. Uh, but right, almost right after, if I understand correctly, shortly after culinary school, you went to kind of an iconic place that's sadly gone now. Yes. Um, that's uh, outside of, uh, you go you go to Astoria, you cross the big awesome bridge, <laughs> uh, you go into Long Beach, and then you go through Long Beach and kind of head your way to Ocean... Um, Ocean Park. Ocean Park. But before you get Ocean Park, there used to be the Ark. Yeah, uh, it was actually just after Ocean Park. Oh, just, okay. So even after Ocean Park. Nakata. Okay. Nakata, Washington. So the Ark Restaurant and Bakery. Uh, Nancy Main and Jamal Lucas uh, ran. And then tilt it like this. And, oh, sorry. Yeah, and hold, <laughs> yeah, hold it like this. Yeah, Okay. Yeah, Nancy, Nancy Main and Jamel Lucas uh, ran an iconic restaurant on Wilpa Bay in Nakata, Washington. Uh, they were doing farm to table and, and cooking from the source before many others. When Alice, you know, when Alice Waters was pioneering in California, Nancy and Jamel were on Wilpa Bay. Um, and they wrote the first cookbook that really defined Northwest cuisine. Uh, and, you know, the restaurant was, we had our oyster beds, uh, surrounded by organic gardens, uh, and you know, really learn cooking from the seasons of, from them. And, um, yeah, so they really kind of instilled in you a love to get the stuff from the farmer seasonally yeah. and cook it. Is Absolute, that... Absolutely. And, and it's sort of, you know, that's been sort of my mantra since, you know, we, uh, we would have fishermen delivered to the back door, the, you know, local farmers and foragers would be delivering to the back doors. And it, uh, it was just a great introduction to that world and uh, and it's stuck with me ever since and and that's really what brought me to Maine. Yeah, what an incredible blessing to be able to work with them and such a bizarre out of the way place. I mean, I've been to Long Beach, you know, I've, I've been to Docks, uh, the tavern, um, yeah. <laughs> uh, a, a dive bar that's kind of certainly- a lot of time in Docks. <laughs> yeah, um, but not everybody has been there. I mean, lots of people in the know in the culinary world made the pilgrimage out to the Ark, but the average right. person didn't. But that's the benefit of kind of Growing up in a middle of nowhere their place like you did is you had access to that. I mean, I yeah. really think the universe kind of prepared you. I, I do too. I mean, I my some of my earliest memories, my parents were big foodies and uh, some of my earliest memories are the uh, Italian herb rolls at the Arc restaurant and, and uh, you know, being able to dine there and hang out on the back of the, uh, in the on the loading dock when I was a kid and it with, with, with the chefs and just being around that restaurant. It really, uh, it was definitely pivotal and inspirational for me as a kid. Yeah, I love that story. I'm a sucker for a good story. I love those. <laughs> um, speaking of a good story, I'm a, uh, as Marv will tell you, I'm a sucker for a good romance. I cry at the drop of a hat. <laughs> um, so part of your story of coming here to Maine uh, involves your business partner and your husband, Kirk. Yes. Um, and as I've been hanging around, he works front of house here. He does. And uh, you know, I've done front of house podcasts, man, uh, podcasts with front of house managers. I just released one with Kate who's worked uh, at prominent restaurants throughout Bozeman for past 20 years, and no one talks to front house managers. So maybe next time I come, I want to come once a year for a while to Maine, I need to sit down and get Kirk's side of the story yeah. <laughs> and talk about front of house stuff because they're fun stories. Yeah. And, you know, I've never had an experience in a restaurant where it was the food was the problem. It was usually front of house failures is usually what people have. Yeah. And not necessarily the food was bad, but some other thing was happening. Sure. And so it's so important. I mean, you have to have good food. But front of house is way more important than people realize. So Absolutely. You know, I'm going to call Shotgun to, you know, getting to talk with him next time. Okay. But uh, you guys, you met, let's see if I have this right. First time, roughly 2006, 2003? Yeah, 2003 or four. At your restaurant, just tangentially. Yep. Just kind of met, said, hey. Yep. Then 2010, you guys um, meet again. Yep. 
snowboarding Mount Hood. Yep, up at Timberline. Yeah, I hope the snow with, was falling and like mutual friend <laughs> Angel's music was playing or something. That sounds really cool. But then you became friends. Yeah, we started became... dating 2016. Yes, and then we're serious. Yep, and then you guys uh, got married during a pandemic last year. Yeah, we got married on St. Patrick's Day last year uh, <laughs> at 8:30 in the morning at the town office here in Stockton Springs. And that's because you guys wanted to get married. Yeah, we had been talking about it, uh, but you know, with the, all the uncertainty around the pandemic and what was happening, we we felt like it was important to get that done. And uh, uh, so we went to the town office, and the tax assessor married us, and and the uh, the ladies from the front office witnessed at <laughs> you know out in front on the front steps of the uh, little town office here in Stockton. <laughs> and part of the reason you had to get it done is because the town office is going to close because of the pandemic, right, and were... then it would have been harder to get married, right. Right. And so we wanted to make, you know, just the way the world was at the time, we really wanted to make sure that that was in place for us. Yeah. And I, when I met him for the first time last night, you know, I wasn't sure that I was going to like him because he had a shirt I loved. <laughs> I'd like, I want that shirt. And then uh, our server last night was James. He also had a nice shirt. Yeah. And like, I like to dress up and like both of those guys was like, darn you and your nice shirts. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He's a very snazzy dresser. <laughs> and uh, some of his art, some of Kurt's art is hanging here. Yeah, Kirk is an amazing creative and uh, and his art uh, hangs on the walls in the restaurant. He has a studio here in the house. We we live in the house uh, upstairs and so he's got a nice studio. He's a painter, photographer. He does all of our branding and uh, social uh, media and um, and our web website development too. Yeah, he's talented. Super talented. And you're proud of him. Yeah, I'm very proud of him. Oh, I love it when people... We're, we're a great team. Yeah, I love it when people are proud of their spouse, yeah. you know, because so many couples, um, they aren't, uh, that I run into at least, and it's a heartache to me. Uh, yeah. But when yeah. you meet a couple that is, it uh, this we, makes we, makes my heart sing. Yeah, we complement each other. Yeah. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of love and intention that went into this project, and uh, and he's a huge part of that. Yeah, you can feel it. It's beautiful. It's beautiful here. You can feel the energy. I'm big on how does energy feel these days. Past few years, like, what is the energy? And it's just wonderful. All right, so... Uh, roughly uh, November 2017 is when you moved here, mm -hmm. but in 2016, is that when you kind of started the journey of heading this way? It was actually January of 2017, so we we left on a road trip across the country, and we had picked out a few places uh, to look at um, potential for opening a restaurant, and one of them was Pittsburgh. Kirk loved Pittsburgh. I had never been to Pittsburgh. I kind of knew a little bit about the food scene that was happening there. Real estate was affordable. And uh, so we went and we spent some time in Pittsburgh. I found out how hot and humid the summers were. And that was sort of a deal breaker for, for me. It's a beautiful city and I love to visit. Uh, we've been back a couple times. But, Good to visit in the fall. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, um, but we, we picked out uh, several properties between Vermont and Maine in New England. And Kirk had come to Maine as a kid vacationing. He's from upstate New York. And, uh, um, and so he really loved Maine and had this connection to Maine. And so I said, great, let's go check it out. And, uh, and I didn't know how amazing it was until we arrived. And I think I knew the first night in Kingfield, uh, that this is where we would, we would land. Um, you knew you'd be somewhere in Maine. Yeah. Yeah. Just the vibe. We stopped at this restaurant called Rolling Fatties that they do burritos and it's really out of the way in this little town of Kingfield that's right by Sugarloaf. And, uh, and, but the, the owners, Rob and Polly, uh, were a really amazing couple and, uh, they were doing farm to table burritos and started sharing, you know, all these stories about the local f food community. And then we were in Kingfield for about a month looking at real estate. And during that time we came out to Belfast, which is about 15 minutes away from here. And there's a, an amazing farmer's market even in the winter here and we and we learned uh you know I start so I started learning about Waldo County and and really the the abundance that's here in Waldo County and uh as far as local farmers local cheesemakers the aquaculture um and ranchers and I mean it's really an incredible place to cook yeah and so um uh, yeah speaking of Belfast I've got a brewery recommendation for you Marshall Wharf they're a pretty good brewery just down the road here they're, fantastic brewery and uh, <laughs> I did a craft beer podcast with them yesterday I, so nice. yeah <laughs> I gotta get my but I really did I loved I loved the brewer yeah. um uh Keith Keith is Keith, the brewer yeah uh, you know Kevin Kevin Kevin's the That's brewer it. yeah I had a Kevin and they have a Kevin um and then um let's see if I can get uh yeah uh, it's great that they save the brewery yes yeah wonderful people and uh just fantastic beer really yeah. like them 
Um, speaking of local, sorry, I'm a bit tired today, but um, last night I got to meet your bartender, John, briefly. Yes. Uh, wonderful guy. I suspect he has way more talents than bartending, so we'll yeah. see what happens from that. But um, I asked, do you have any local gin? He goes, well, I mean local from Maine. He says, well, I've got Blue Baron. And like, I was a Blue Baron yesterday. And so I was like, yes, I get to have a Blue Baron martini. I had their, like eight of their mar- gins, you know, at the distillery. And then I get to have a martini before your amazing dinner. So I was happier than a pig in mud. Yeah, they're making delicious gin. So this building, you came across, how'd you find this building we're sitting in? So uh, we we made four trips to Maine in that time, in that the first part of 2017. And... Uh, um, and this, uh, this building was being sold as I f- actually found it on Redfin when we were back in New York at Kirk's parents' house. Uh, and because we looked at Belfast originally, Belfast proper originally, and there wasn't, um, there wasn't really anything we could afford or, um, in that, that was, that didn't need a ton of renovation, you know, that was, would have been cost prohibitive on our budget. And so... We started looking around Belfast and looking, coming, you know, from away, looking at a map. Uh, Stockton Springs is right at the head of the bay. We're close to everything, but we're not in the middle of anything. And so, uh, and we never really wanted to be in a tourist trap. I grew up in a tourist trap as a kid, and I uh, didn't want to have a line at the door. You know, we we wanted to be a really relaxed dining experience with a and and so we looked at we found this house, and I just started searching square footage, honestly, and and. Uh, found this place it, w- it was a um, you know it had been for sale for 10 years and uh it was done in a it had had a period correct renovation done in the late 80s with lots of wallpaper and lacy curtains and all kinds of things and I showed it to Kirk and he's like oh that's way too precious we can't <laughs> we can't go there <laughs> he didn't even want to look at it I was like so we picked out some other places and we looked at those and then I was like come on we got to go look at this place and I think we knew we we made it maybe 25 feet into the building from the front door and we kind of looked at each other and we're like, this is it. And so we walked into the next room and the realtor was in there and we said, okay, what do we have to do to get this place? And, uh, and that was the, that was the beginning. Yeah. Now I will put up, um, if people listen to this podcast, if you go to culinarytreasure.com, I'll have a, this is culinary treasure article about my magnificent meal I had. And I got some great photos of the space. Uh, cause this is a great place to have a meal. Um, it's Thank just you. phenomenal. Uh, and you guys spent a lot, what, eight months renovating? Eight months renovating. And uh, you tore off the wallpaper, tore down lots the. Of, lots of lacy wallpaper curtains. removal, lots of lacy curtain removal. We modern, I think we, I think we blended the mix of modern and, and honored the heritage of the house too. We've, it's got a lot of original detail and character and, and is largely intact. And the, the home is actually on the National Register of Historic Places. And, and a lot of attention to detail that, um, some places don't have just like the um the sound baffling yeah <laughs> uh, that i was so grateful for that um one of the worst meals i had in my life was in a town so man and name they put us in this new room they'd had and i i couldn't hear anything it was so right. loud and so uh, there's little things like that everywhere that like really the food's amazing but then with that attention to detail that craftsmanship craftsmanship really augment the experience so hats off to you and thank Kirk. you thank you for noticing yeah it's uh yeah it's you know, when I told my kids the problem with those kind of, you know, those sound baffling things is that they get full of sound. You have to drain them every year. I don't know if you knew that. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> <laughs> my kids knew it until they got older and then they went, yeah, dad lied to us. That's not true. <laughs> I'll make sure we ring them out when you leave. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so you took uh, eight months and then you opened in June of... June of 2018. June of 2018. And... And uh, to very little fanfare, <laughs> we we've sort of flown under the radar, uh, but we've stayed. It's been really word of mouth and uh, and social media, and that's what's kept our dining room full. And it's grown really organically in a in a sustainable way, and allowed us to to get our feet under us and and grow our staff and also um, and grow the building. You know, we've expanded from just the first two small dining rooms. Now we have three more dining spaces that we've since finished since the original, you know, every winter we've, and then during COVID we've taken more time to restore the house. And uh, something interesting uh, that you did, uh, not only were you remodeling uh, through through early 2018 to open in June, but in at least for at least spring of 2018, if not sooner, uh, you taught me a new term that I'm excited to learn um, or word Mofka. Did I get it right? Yeah. Mofka. Yeah. So talk to us about Mofka. So the Maine Organic Farmer and Growers Association, it's the oldest organic uh, farming organization in the United States. It started here in Maine. And uh, 
So when we arrived in November of 2017, we I got the Mafka guide, which is like a catalog of all the farms, and then there's a lot of other helpful tips in it. But uh, started reaching out to these farms in the area, saying, you know, we're going to open this restaurant. <clears throat> Pardon me, we're going to open this restaurant, and and we want to buy from you. And uh, and so how do we do that? And um, and then started building these relationships and getting product, trying product, um, you know, going to the farmers markets regularly and introducing ourselves. And uh, and I don't think everybody took us serious at you know to begin with because they're like you know who are these guys that <laughs> everyone was a little skeptical. But uh, yeah, I, in Minnesota, I lived there for three years. You know, there someone told me before you moved there, well they'll be nice to you, but until you've been there a while, you're not really local. The first time I went to Bozeman, they were really skeptical. Well, who's this idiot from Portland, Oregon? Right. <laughs> um, and so I, I get it. Maine kind of seems to have that little bit of, we'll see. It does. You know, we'll see. I think uh, they wanted to see if we'd survive our first winter. Yeah, there you go. So, <laughs> and we did. And uh, and so we, yeah, so we opened and, and it, originally, you know, the first summer we would drive around Waldo County with, uh, in the van and we would load the van up. We'd hit all these different farms and, and, and we just showed up every week to pick up produce, you know, and, and then year two, uh, some folks started delivering to us and, uh, and now we work with the farms, you know, in January, we, we start planning for, uh, crop production for the next summer. So like this January, I'll get with uh, a few of our key farmers and, uh, and we'll, I'll commit to buying certain quantities of produce and, uh, you know, at different times throughout the growing season. And it's right in line with what you learned at the Ark and the vision they kind of cast for Absolutely. you. Absolutely. You know, buy from the buy from the local people. Because I think, what did I, well, I think James, incredible server, yep. uh, took care of us last night. I think he said almost everything came within 25 miles of here. Yeah, 25 miles or less. I mean, most of it's actually about 12. But uh, Oh, good, because that extra 13. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, that's no. so, so wonderful. Yeah, you know, and... Uh, I mean, we have we have a new uh, oyster farm that's right down the the road here, a half a mile down the road, right in Stockton Harbor, uh, that uh, just came. They just came to market this year, but three years ago when they were starting, you know, we were a new restaurant too, and we met at a at some local function, and th- they said we're you know we're starting an oyster farm in Stockton Harbor, and uh, I said, well, great, I'll buy all your oysters when you're ready, and uh, and so we have, and and within three now with. This was their first year to market, and in three more years, they'll have about 30,000 oysters a year, so they'll be able to sell commercially to a bunch of other places. But right now, we have their oysters exclusively. And, and forgive me for not remembering, I was up at four in the morning filming at Ruckus Donuts. Yeah. <laughs> but the oyster, we had their oysters last night. You didn't, actually. You you had morning dews. We'll have Stockton. That's right. Morning yeah. dews. I remember that. Yeah, now. Which, but what did you put on those oysters last night? They were. I remember they were amazing. Oh, Jimmy Nardello sweet peppers. Yes. Yeah. <sighs> So, uh, yeah, a super, super sweet, flavorful pepper that uh, only one farm in this area grows, and uh, that's Calix Farm. And uh, Alex from Calix actually lived in the Pacific Northwest, and that was the only other time that I had Jimmy Nardello's was in Oregon. And so uh, I was really excited, and he knew he knew the, the peppers from out there, too, and so they've been growing them here for us. Yeah, I love oysters, you know, being from the Pacific yeah. Northwest. And when I had those last night, they were they were spot on. Yeah. So you know they were fantastic. Yeah, the the aquaculture industry here is amazing. I mean, there's so many different local uh so many different new oyster farms and uh and because of the shape of Maine's coastline, there's so many different flavors of oysters because some have very little freshwater in- introduction, so they're super briny and sweet. Some have a lot of uh Freshwater introduction, so they're more minerally and... Uh, well, like Belfast is uh, the river and the ocean at the right, same time, right? At the right. confluence of both, for example. Exactly. And for those that know Pacific Northwest geography, um, from my opinion, just being in Maine for a few days, it's kind of like uh, being around Olympia or Bellingham, the yep. Puget Sound, on steroids. Yep. There's like inlets and islands and just everywhere. It's, I mean, it, it also means it takes forever to get anywhere because you got to drive down. <laughs> um, but it is, there's oceans everywhere. It's incredible. Yeah. It's vast. I mean, it's vast and beautiful and there's so- Stunningly beautiful. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's a very, very special place. Yeah, I've wanted to come here for since high school because of a teacher and I've just been, I've just fallen in love. It's just amazing. Yeah. So I, we'll probably talk about some of the things I had last night because they're amazing, but I want to make it clear to people, they need to come have dinner here and I have no idea what the hell they're going to eat. Because it's two reasons. One, it's seasonal. Yep. And so you're going to, whatever you're having at that time of year, whatever, and then it's what speaks to your heart. Right. Right. So if the apples are great for you in, um, you know, in uh, October, great. But if it's something else, that's what you'll have. Right. What's in season and what speaks to your heart. And then you've shifted to a different menu style. Yeah. So um, 
post, well, post pandemic, I mean, we're still in the pandemic, but we, we were closed for a year uh, due to the pandemic uh, because the seating restrictions were, wouldn't allow us to operate in a profitable way. Uh, so we decided to, we reduced our seating capacity and we've continued to do that. And, and so everything's well-spaced. And with that, we decided to go to a prefi model. And we're really excited about the prefi model because it allows me to give people a very intentional experience. So if you come to the restaurant, you're eating what's in season this week right now in Waldo County. And uh, and the menu can change nightly. Sometimes someone will drop off, you will have a forager drop off 20 pounds of uh, chicken of the woods mushrooms. And so we're doing a tartine with chicken of the woods. Yeah, uh, we, th- we had those last night you, and you, those were fantastic. Yeah, thank you. Uh, they were, and see, what else, um, I don't have my notes, you brought my notes. What else went on those? It was... Um, Oh, uh, well, they, I, I did them with a little bit of cognac, uh, shallot, and uh, and then some uh, micro dill sprouts. Yes, a duck cell. You, yep. did, you did duck cell. Yep. And, but then that's what it was. It was those darn micro dill sprouts. Yeah. So, uh, dill and mushrooms, phenomenal. I'm yeah. stealing that idea. Thank you. Yeah. I, it's, a, it's not a common pairing. No, it was amazing. All of your food... Um, it was just really vibrant. I felt like I was actually, not the qual- qu- quantity, but like I was eating something that had wonderful flavor, not at all close to over the top when I say vibrant, but it's like, oh, this is good. This is full of flavor oh, and really, so really enjoyable. Just for example, like the, the duck cell was perfect and what you're going to go for it. You actually did, uh, it was fun to hear James. He really admires you as a chef or server bragging about it. shallots, shallots and cognac. Okay. Uh, but <laughs> then to put the micro dill on, it's like, oh, that was just perfect. Sets it off a little bit. Yeah, just perfect. Yeah. Um, so I got excited about those and got distracted. Oh, so it's not only though local, what's grown that year, but the stuff that speaks to your heart. Right. And so the people that come, they'll just come and have the food and they're, and the amazing thing, um, with the prefi is you get, you get to have like, uh, not really, but in my head, I had a hundred different things last <laughs> night, you know, and I got yeah. to try little bites of all of them and it's really just an incredible experience. Yeah. We sell it as a five course and sometimes it's eight to 10. It just really depends on, uh, on what's happening and yeah that's the fun thing is that you have your menu with you the things you're going to get but then oh here's another surprise from the chef and it's like oh this is so exciting <laughs> yeah it's fun for me too <laughs> so yeah and then um oh, the ginger ice cream last night yeah uh, brown betty yep. that was amazing that was fantastic but then that ginger ice cream yeah and that ginger was raised a mile down the road at frog song farm like these this young couple started this farm shortly after we bought the restaurant and so, uh, and they've, they've gr- grown ginger this year and it's fantastic young, you know, it's sushi quality, young ginger. So, uh, prefi generally the way you do it, if someone doesn't know what it is, they're going to get like a, like an appetizer, a couple different things, like an appetizer. Yep. They'll get something like maybe a little bit of soup or on a spoon or uh, an oyster. Yep. And then like a little bit of maybe a main course or two. Yeah, right. Is that? Yep. Right. And we, we, we've, we've. I like to give people like a really ample sample. So like, I, I don't want people to leave here hungry. <laughs> so we, we, uh, I, I've been to, you know, prefies that are, that are really portioned down and, and, uh, and you want to go out for a burger after. Yeah. 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 yeah that, that's not the case last night. Yeah. That's not the, and I don't like to eat that way and I don't like people to feel that way, you know? So I feel like, um, you know, you get a, a few things are smaller and intensely flavored, but intentionally so. Yes. Yep. And so that's the uh, the idea. And then I love that you get dessert as part of it. That's always yeah. on a good pre- <laughs> in my world and a pre a good pre I get some kind of fun dessert. It thing. should always be dessert. <laughs> yes, exactly. You always finish strong. <laughs> <laughs> and so one long as we're talking about the dinner last night, one of my complaints, um, this look, so you make your own bread. Yep. The the baguette, the bread was phenomenal. Hats off to you on that. And then I got one of these butter things and this butter is probably the best butter experience I've ever had. And I'm like a <laughs> butter connoisseur. I love butter. Like I used to be accused of like using it like candy on yeah. my bread. Yeah. And I own happinessismeltedbutter.com. And like I wanted 19 of those things of butter, not just one. <laughs> what the heck was in that? But I could taste the chives. Yep. I could taste, I could identify sea salt. Yep. And if it's not there, just tell me, you know, because I, I, I'm convinced it was. Yeah. But there was something else that just... It was over the top. Yeah, so it's it's uh, so I culture the butter with buttermilk. So after it's so I soften it and then whip it up with buttermilk, and that buttermilk gives it this additional tang. And then actually, a few days after it's made, it it, it gets better because of that buttermilk culture. So I'm just going to tell people I had a fermented butter. Yeah, it is basically <laughs> it's basically fermented butter. 
It's not quite ghee though, because you don't get that heavy, heavy tang, but it gives it this, uh, you get that sweet, salty tang and, and it's, it's yeah. uh, special. So I know it's kind of your own recipe, but what inspired that? Where'd that come from in your journey? That came from whipping butter at the Ark restaurant years oh, and years ago. Oh, wow. All the way back <laughs> so then. So 25 years ago <laughs> was the, the foundation for that butter. Yeah, and if ever I'm going to come back, I'm putting a special. When I come back, I'm putting a special order, and I just want a bunch of those. And <laughs> the server will just roll their eyes at me, like, "Go away, you lunatic!" <laughs> I, I think we can arrange that. <laughs> so, and it's um. So, I just I want to encourage people: come for the pre fee, come have the meal. Don't yeah. know what you're going to get, but it's seasonal, it's fun, and you get a better taste of the land, and the food is better quality. Um, yeah. I mean, I am weird, and I will eat. Uh, I love dive bars, and I will have a BLT in the dead of February sure. when it's cold as heck, late night at a dive bar, because, hey, I love BLTs. Yeah. But a BLT with an heirloom tomato, you know, in August is a bazillion times better. Right. Yep. Right. Yeah, same thing. That's why you just come here and have those experiences, have that food. Uh, you'll be much, much happier. Kirk and I would love to have you. <laughs> so so uh, you've got something else in the works. Um, Sears Port? Yes. Yeah, five minutes away. It's a town five minutes away. Right. Right. And uh, Hayes Sailor, what's that going to be? So Hayes Sailor is our ode to uh, to our love of dive bars. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so uh, it's uh, we're calling it a gastro dive bar. So it's going to be uh, you know super comfortable, casual, uh, and but the food's going to be decidedly lowbrow, but well executed and um, and fun. And the cocktails uh, are inspired by. Uh, basically ports uh, around the world. Sears Port is known as a, um, well, it was a, a large shipbuilding um, harbor in uh, back in the 1800s. And the, there's a great maritime museum there, and they're all about honoring the, the seafaring history of, of Sears Port. So we figured, hey, sailor would be a, a perfect fit. <laughs> I think it's hilarious. <laughs> now, you know, I took my son and I took a trip to Cincinnati December 2019. And uh, he knows I love dive bars, and so he thought he would we'd go to a dive bar. So we went to a place in Cincinnati called Dive Bar. Nice. <laughs> and it was beautiful. It was a beautiful bar. And he goes, isn't this great, Dad? I said, yeah, but it's not a dive bar. And yep. he goes, what? He goes, I said, yeah, it's, it's too bright. It's too clean. The servers are too helpful. It doesn't smell bad. The seats aren't torn with duct tape. And he <laughs> looked, my son looks at me like I've lost my mind. And then the guy two seats down says, hey, I'm the owner here, and your dad's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's true. It's true. We're probably not going to be a true dive bar. So, <laughs> so they sent us down the road to a place that had all of those ingredients. And the, the bartender, who was a wonderful human being, looked like a serial killer, the way the light was on him. The, it ripped torn seats. Um, it smelled terrible. That was a dive bar. So I think I'm going to have a wonderful experience at Hay Sailor. I think it's going to be like your ode to a dive bar, dive bar reminiscent. Yes, dive, uh, dive bar influenced. <laughs> but given what I saw, um, I didn't get to interact with as many of your staff as I wanted. They all seem pretty awesome, but Angie and James and John, yeah. uh, I don't think you're going to have any surly people working at, um, maybe you could give some dive bar training to them, yeah. but I think it's going to be an incredible <laughs> over the top experience with dive bar reminiscent food. Is that right? Right. Yeah. I think, yeah, you're, you're right. I think it's probably, uh, you know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just having fun. No, I'm no, no. Fun. You're, you're not wrong. Uh, <laughs> it's definitely, um, yeah, I don't think Kirk and I know how to do dive bar exactly. Uh, and also the, the building, you know, the interior needs to age for a good 20 years before. <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's hard to have a dive bar now cause you don't smoke inside anymore to get right. that patina of grime yeah. you know, that cigarette smoke gave to places. Yeah. And the, uh, the, the whiff of urinal cake wafting from yes, there. <laughs> there. Exactly. That's the what bathroom. you need. That's what you need for a true dive bar. That's exactly right. Uh, but I'm super excited. So Roughly spring of 2022, hey, Sailor yeah, we'll open? Yeah, we'll be well off and running by spring. Okay, so if I come back next fall, I don't know if I'm coming late summer, fall, or early winter, I don't know, but it'll be open then. Absolutely, and I can come yeah. Check it Sailor out. will go year-round, whereas the Hitchport is a little slightly more seasonal. When, after Sailor opens, it'll be open year-round, five days a week. And so currently, for the next few years at least, and check the website if things change, um, but currently, as I understand it, uh, November, you kind of take a break. Yep. We take a couple weeks off. And then December 1, roughly, yep. through New Year's Day, you're open for Christmas and yeah. New Year's, I mean, New Year's Eve dinner. Yeah, and we people do a need, New Year's Eve dinner. You should book that out in September or mm. August. Yep. Because I think it's going to sell out every year. Yeah, it usually sells out by October. Yep. And then you take roughly January and February off, mm -hmm. uh, maybe March, and then you open back up in April. Right, right. As soon as this, the first farm, real farm production starts, we 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 open right back up. 
Yeah, excellent. Whereas you will have the bad tomatoes at uh, Hey Sailor in February for my bad BLT. It's quite possible. I don't think so. <laughs> I think you'll still have, I think. Actually, give, Maine has great hothouse tomatoes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, given your passion for food and what I had last night, it'll still be amazing yeah. food, even if it's in the February. Uh, very excited about that. Um, what makes for a good chef, in your opinion? Uh makes a good chef i think humility uh creativity and drive and uh and also um um passion i mean of course you got to have passion but um humility is really important I, th I think um uh you know we're in a real hospitality is a very special industry uh, you're feeding people um and i even have to remember this for myself it's 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 great to stay you know, humble. And I'm, you know, I have a lot of gratitude that we're here in Maine. We moved 3000 miles and we've been able to open a restaurant and, and exist in a real way. And, um, I have a lot of gratitude that for people that come and dine with us every night and, uh, and the creative side, I think the creative side ebbs and flows because honestly, when you're in this industry, you're in a, under a lot of pressure and, and creativity can be hard sometimes. And so, you know, it's, it's great to, to get out and, and eat, you know, eat lots of food and see what other people are cooking and, and you never know where you're going to find an inspiration. And, uh, and as far as drive, it's, it's being able to get up every morning and, and get to work and make it happen and make it happen, you know, not just for yourself, but for your staff and, and for your community. And, um, and that's, uh, that's, that's how I feel about it. <laughs> I think that's great. And, I, and when you talked about you're grateful to be here in Maine, I wish people could have seen I wish we were filming because the, the, the real sincerity on your face. And Maine, Maine feels like home now, doesn't it? It does. It absolutely does. I mean, there's a lot of parallels between Maine and the Pacific Northwest in, in, in all the best ways. Yeah, I feel like I could live here in Maine and be quite happy. Yep. It just has that kind of vibe and the people seem genuine. You know, as much as we joke about, ah, who are you from? There's that real, there's the grit and the hard work right. and the genuineness because I just... I just don't do well with pretension. That's just not me. I just can't do it. Or disingenuousness. Uh, is that even a word? I probably made it up. <laughs> um, but I just, but it feels like Maine just has those qualities that I would, that would really speak to my heart. It does. The, uh, the people have grit and um, a little great example is people still write personal checks here. <laughs> you know, when we opened the restaurant, the bank was like, are you guys going to take personal checks? Right. I'm like, I haven't taken a personal check in, you know, 15 years at least. And he's like, oh no, you got to take personal checks. And so uh, yeah, you know, it, and you can take people mo at their word. I mean, it's, uh, um, it still has that kind of small town, even though it's a large state, it has a very small town vibe. Yeah. And as we were waiting outside, uh, you know, we got here early and we're, I kind of like just get the vibe of a place and people were showing up and they're kind of looking at us. And I think I must look like an outsider. I don't know. Maybe it was my <laughs> leather jacket. I thought it looked cool, but maybe it made me stick out like a sore thumb. And, um, I had what, three different people. This it was not their first time, and they loved here, and they were excited that I was coming here, and like, oh, you're gonna love it, and it was like, man, the regulars uh, for this kind of experience. It was really, it really warmed my heart to yeah. hear that. Yeah, we I, we have great customers. Um, yeah, <laughs> it's it's so cool, and uh, you know, we're we're off the beaten path. We're not too far from, you know, some what larger you know hubs, but. Uh, but we're not really in the middle of anything. And so it's it's so the people that find us uh, seem to be the right people. Well, I think people need to drive for a good meal, a good dining experience. Mm -hmm. And so you're not, what, what we're, how far are we from Portland? Two hours? We're two hours from Portland. Yeah, Portland, Portland, Maine, mm -hmm. uh, for my friends on the Northwest side yeah. of the country. But uh, we're only two hours from Portland, Maine. And if you're staying at Portland, Maine, Drive up for the day. Yeah, it's a beautiful ha Have drive. a great time up here in Belfast. Uh, book, make your reservation so you can get in because it's hard to get a reservation here. It's so amazing. And then come here for dinner and then drive home to Maine, drive back to drive back to Portland. It's not that big a deal. Yeah, take the one if you come up. Take the one. It's, it's gorgeous and there's a lot of really great places to stop and visit. Yeah, or if you're staying somewhere north of here or you're headed through, what are we, everyone tells me to go, Booth Bay? Oh, Booth Bay Harbor, yeah. Yeah, uh, or Bar Harbor. Uh, I can't, yeah. Bar Harbor. Bar Harbor. Yeah, just, yeah, this is, so I know it's not, you say it's out of the way, but I think it's actually on the way or it's definitely worth the drive. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. yeah, it's just again we had fantastic dining experience. I mean, other than the complaints about the butter, yeah. Uh, oh. But it's probably better for me that you did give me nineteen of them because I need to function and live a long time. Watch my cholesterol. I, I try to. I, so the the intention of the prefee too is to have people make it through the entire dinner, and uh, and so I don't want people to tap out. You know, by course six, they're like, uh, I can't eat anymore. You know, so it's it's that fine line of keeping people full, but also, uh, yeah, not yeah. I know you did fantastic. I got plenty of food and got um and just got lots and lots of wonderful flavors and uh you know i I just i knew i was having an incredible dining experience which is a lot of fun when you're in the midst of it awesome uh well charlie it's been a joy to have you on the podcast and i'm so grateful that michael said hey i got the place for you friday night yeah i am too that's uh (laughs) some kismet right (laughs) yes and all the best to you and kirk thank you and next time i come i think i need to sit down with him and have a front uh, get his story his side of the journey yeah absolutely you know of you guys connecting and opening this place up and then some fun front of house the ones we can tell the front of house stories we can tell yes because it's such front of house is so important to a dining experience and so many people don't know it. Nobody covers it, but I do because I like it. Yeah. So it's an important piece of the puzzle. Yeah. All right. Well, cheers. Thank you, my friend. Absolutely. Thank you.